Hello and welcome to, w to WTTW's First Hand Living in Poverty discussion. My name is Tim Russell, Vice President Community Engagement and Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for WTTW WFMT. And I'm excited that you have joined us for this important conversation. Our purpose is to enrich lives, engage communities, and inspire exploration. Through our broadcast and digital platforms, we educate and entertain children and families and share the stories of women and men who have influenced Chicago, America, and the world. In firsthand living in poverty, WTTW presents a documentary series, reported text stories, expert talks, and community discussions with a supporting discussion guide, all of which can be found on WTTW.com backslash firsthand. Today, we are partnering with the Greater Chicago Food Depository for a conversation about food equity in Illinois. Part of the First Hand Living in Poverty event series, the discussion will be moderated by Dan Protest and a panel of very distinguished guests. Community engagement for First Hand Living in Poverty is made possible in part by Caris Foundation, Inc. A special thanks to our supporters. Lead support for First Hand Living in Poverty is provided by the Granger Foundation and Becky and Lester Knight, the Knight Family Foundation. Major support is provided by Jim and Kay Maybe, Randy and Carrie McMillan, Butler Family Foundation, Denny and Sandy Cummings, the Harry and Jeanette Weinberg Foundation, Lou Collins, Edwardson Family Foundation, Mark and Jean Mamati Family Foundation, Kristen Carlson Vogan and Sean Vogan, and the Duncan Family Foundation. Before we begin, let's watch the trailer to First Hand Living in Poverty. I need money to move out. I need money for a car. I need money to get my license. But I mean, if I look at it all like that, I get overwhelmed. I couldn't even buy my kids nothing for Christmas because I had to choose between making that car payment or getting them something. It's like you worrying and you going through day-to-day -day life with so much that you face with. I feel like I'm constantly playing catch up all the time. I'll get so far and then something else will get thrown at me. I don't want my kids to feel like they stuck and they trapped. You know, I want them to go see the world. I want to get out of the neighborhood. I want to get my family out of the neighborhood. Sometimes when you're a mother, you just have to keep pushing no matter what. I love my daughter. I know she loves me. I want a better life for her. I look to God to take care of me and my family. I know some way, somehow, that he'll make a way for me to make ends meet. I took the opportunity that was given and built something a little better out of it. I try to remain optimistic, and somebody's going to say, I'll give you a chance. You failed. It's OK. Get back up. It's not in the falling. It's in the getting back up that makes you who you are. Hello and welcome. I'm Dan Protest, executive producer of WTTW series First Hand Living in Poverty. And welcome now to our guests, Kate Mayer, who's the executive director and CEO of the Greater Chicago Food Depository. She's also the co-chair of the Illinois Commission uh, uh, to End Hunger, as well as Deputy Governor of Illinois, Sol Flores. She's the other co-chair of the state's Hunger Commission. Antonio Mariscal, who's a pastor of the Emanuel Church, which runs a food pantry in the Belmont Cragen neighborhood and Patricia Jackson Walker, one of the five people featured in our First Hand Living in Poverty series. Patricia uh, works at a uh, WIC food center in Gage Park. Thanks everyone for being here. Kate Mayer and uh, Deputy Governor Flores, your commission just released what you're calling a roadmap to end hunger in Illinois. It makes some really interesting recommendations, which I, I wanna get to in a few minutes. But first, let's talk about the pandemic, which is really kind of the elephant in the room when it comes to poverty right now. It's greatly increased hunger in this state. Pastor Antonio, you've witnessed this yourself at your food pantry in Belmont Cragen. What have you seen? Well, we've seen uh, an, an uh, enormous amount of people coming out that would normally not even think of coming out. Uh, our numbers skyrocketed. I mean, uh, pre-COVID, pre we were doing about 100 20 families a week. 
And in the months right uh, after COVID, which it was uh, May, June, July, we were serving 2,000 families in a week. So you can imagine the need from 120 to about 2,000 a week. And this has to do in part with the sectors of the economy that typically employ people in your neighborhood? Yes. Uh, a lot of uh, the people within our neighborhoods are uh, essential workers. So uh, some of them um, had jobs, a lot of them lost jobs because everything was closed. So um, they, they, they couldn't go to work, they couldn't get money. And so they ended up in the food pantry. Deputy Governor Flores, Illinois has fared worse than most states. We've seen about a 50% increase in food insecurity. Nearly 2 million people in this state are now food insecure. Um, I know these statistics are fluctuating from day to day. Why has Illinois been hit uh, so hard? Well, I think, you know, Dan, as we know, there were issues of inequity, you know, deeply seated across our state before the pandemic. Um, communities of color, um, children as part of families, people with disabilities, people experiencing homelessness. I mean, they were already disproportionately impacted and COVID really helped to shine a brighter light on that. Um, I think as a state, we've been working incredibly hard um, to strengthen our safety net. Um, and there's a lot of opportunity and, and a lot more work ahead. Patricia, food insecurity has different forms. Um, there's obviously uh, not having the means to eat at all, but there's also not being able to afford nutritious food or relying on cheap calories. Is this something you've experienced in your own life or, or seen with your customers at the WIC grocery? Uh, absolutely. Um, you know, with everything that's going on, uh, working or not working and trying to save um, every little bit that you have, it's like um, the the food that's bad for you is cheaper than the food that's good for you. So, um, of course, you're going to go with what you more so can afford. Interesting. Deputy Governor, I'd like to get at why that is. Uh, there was a study by the AMA that showed that the costs of fats and oils and sugars has decreased over a 20 year period, but the cost of fresh fruits and vegetables increased by 50% over that same time period. And the cul culprit really seems to be agriculture subsidies. Um, you know, most of oh, the wow. calories, the majority of the calories we're consuming as Americans come from subsidized foods like corn and soy. Is it time to rethink which foods we in encourage our farmers to grow? I, I think that's right, Dan. I mean, you know, food subsidies are part of a national and federal conversation that have been going on in this country for a very long time as we think about how to support farmers and what's best to make to, you know, get to our kitchen tables. Uh, but certainly we want to ensure, you know, equity means that parents and families like Patricia's don't have to decide between, you know, bananas and oranges or hot chips, right? That their families can be fed in the same way that we expect anyone else. Kate Mayor, uh, as you well know, food insecurity is not new to this pandemic, and it's also not specific to any one community. I was struck, I saw that the, the highest usage of food assistance in Illinois is in Saline County. I had to look at a map to figure out where that is. It's down by Kentucky. Draw a picture for us of who's most vulnerable in our state. Sure, and let me, and let me actually start. Uh, I wanna lift up something that you said, Dan, that I think it's incredibly important and the deputy governor touched on this as well. This is not new. Food insecurity isn't something that all of a sudden presented itself to Illinois and the rest of the country when COVID arrived. If we would have been having this conversation 14 months ago, we still would have had a problem. There were more than a million people a year ago who were struggling with basic access to food in every county of the state. What we know before COVID and as the deputy governor said, this has only been accelerated and frankly intensified during COVID is that it is the most vulnerable of our neighbors and it is oftentimes communities of color. So African-American and Latino households with children in particular, as well as older adults and people with disabilities who are most likely to be impacted by food insecurity. And the challenge is to sort of not think about this as a sort of one moment um, that we've had this problem, but this is really an ongoing reality that is a reflection of poverty. 
you say communities of color. I, I also just mentioned a predominantly white downstate county. It seems like what what the, the point is that it's not and there's not any one face to hunger in Illinois. That it's it's actually a, a pretty diverse set of problems, not a single problem. It is, and it's a it's a reflection of poverty, and there and there are multiple facets of poverty. And so when we look at at the far southern counties, in Illinois, there's there is um, a, an economic landscape where jobs have been lost, and there hasn't been new economic opportunity. Um, there are aging communities where there are older adults and people with disabilities, and so it's a multifaceted um, reflection of poverty. So before we get to your report, a very quick bit of very boring business. What are WIC and SNAP? If you could just define those for us. Uh, uh, Patricia's, Patricia's the expert on WIC. Uh, I'll, 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 maybe I'll do SNAP and she can do WIC. Uh, SNAP, <laughs> SNAP is shorthand. It stands for the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. It's what sometimes also gets referred to as food stamps. So it's a federal program that provides benefits to people who qualify based on their income and their benefits are paid out on what's known as an EBT card. So an electronic benefit transfer card, benefits get loaded up. Those dollars can only be used at qualifying stores and only for food items. And Patricia Wick is? Um, somewhat um, the same as SNAP, but um, Wick stands for women, infant and children. And also, um, like she said, it's, um, uh, you get now we just transferred over to the EBT cards, but it's a WIC EBT card and you get your certain amount of um, items on your card and you can spend it at certain stores as well. And you have to um, get whatever's on that card. And um, it's for children, for moms that's pregnant or have uh, any kids five and under. So these are federal programs, entitlement programs, and what the Commission to End Hunger uh, report really highlights is that people in Illinois aren't fully taking advantage of these programs. 59% of those who qualify for WIC are not enrolled in the program, 59%. Deputy Governor Flores, explain why we as a state are leaving these federal dollars on the table. Yeah, I think it's, it's really about access. And as much as you know, we're talking here today, um, and you know, folks like Patricia and the pastor are on the ground. There's a whole there are communities of people around the state that don't know about benefits, don't know what they're entitled to get. Um, some people experience fear or shame in getting access to those benefits, and sometimes you know, there's a, a boatload of bureaucracy that accompanies getting those benefits, and so folks may get distracted or too busy. Uh, you know, dealing with the rest of life, taking care of their kids or loved ones or their own illnesses. And so I think one of the things that the, the report really highlights is how we can do better. What yeah. else can we do in innovative ways to get the information to people, to reduce and eliminate barriers, um, and to make food prolific and everywhere throughout the state? So one of those barriers you just said is, is red tape. Uh, how can we try to cut the, the red tape attached to those federal programs. Well, I'll start and then Kate, you should add more detail here, uh, but certainly at the state level, we're looking to see what are ways that we can make enrollment easier. How can we use uh, telephone apps? How can we uh, make it very easy? You know, many people throughout the pandemic have experienced, you know, Grubhub or online banking or, you know, signing up for my COVID test. And we do all that through our telephone. How can we also ensure, you know, families can sign up for WIC and SNAP in that same way? So leveraging technology that's made such an impact in the rest of our lives uh, that way. I think the other thing is we can look at, you know, uh, work around presumptive eligibility. We know who folks are across the state. You know, we're touching them in various different programs. You know, how can we funnel them all through one and say, you know what, if we're touching you through our Department of Children and Family Services or Medicaid, you know, we're going to presume you need this as well um, and get them access. Kate, what else? Well, I, I just want to say, first of all, so I've known the Deputy Governor um, as for a long time as a partner in this work before she entered state government. And I have to say, just listening to her, I love 
her energy. And I love the fact that we have a deputy governor who talks about a boatload of bureaucracy because that's exactly right. We have- Although, Kate, sorry to interrupt you. The question might come up if, if the problem is red tape from the federal government is the state with its own set of bureaucracies in the best position to cut red tape. So I, I actually think the fact that we have the deputy governor who is leaning into this work and has been a part of identifying solutions is, is one of the things that gives me a great deal of hope right now. This is a, this is a roadmap that was co-created um, by a group of stakeholders across the state. And the deputy governor was one of the people at the table rolling up her sleeves saying, this is where we can do better. So just to, just to, to get into this, there are, there is a boatload of bureaucracy at the federal level and also the state level. We have made these programs so hard to get. Um, and, and sometimes from good intentions, we wanna make sure that people aren't abusing a system, but in doing that, we've made it absolutely impossible if you don't have a car or if you have children that you're trying to care for to get to appointments. And as a result, people are not getting these programs that we know have demonstrated success in lifting people out of poverty and also providing something as critical as food. And that also represents an opportunity. And I'll just talk about SNAP for one moment. Those federal dollars that get left on the table not only does it mean that an individual or a family doesn't have the dollars that they need to be able to get food, those dollars don't get spent in grocery stores in Illinois. And those grocery stores then aren't able to hire people. And ultimately the money from that program goes back to the farmer in Illinois. So it's, it is an important program that has a host of benefits. And the deputy governor also mentioned technology. We live in an age where we like to think technology is the solution to everything. What, what, what role does technology play in addressing hunger? So, uh, so a couple of things, and she, she lifted up a few of those. So we see technology as being a key way for people to be able to access information, but also ultimately to fill out applications. I, I use the example, I, I could go on my phone right now and order a pair of shoes and it will arrive at my home tomorrow. And yet yeah. we make it a paper-based system where somebody she has to go in person to fill out paperwork and it takes two months to be able to get something as critical yes. as food. So we can leverage technology to help people um, get applications expedited and ultimately to be able to be linked to these programs, to find out information, to text out information when there are changes in the way programs operate is another really important opportunity. And Deputy Governor, who do you imagine will create and implement this technology? And, and I suppose, just as importantly, who would pay for it? Well, I think it's a mix, Dan. You know, one of the things that the state has done really well is find partners. We recognize what we do well and what we don't do well. Uh, and across the state, there's many examples of agencies working with third-party vendors, nonprofits, other community-based organizations to help us implement and, and harness the best power. We want to make sure we take uh, very closely guarded taxpayer dollars and invest them um, with vendors and partners that will help us succeed. Seed. I think one of the things that the report highlights and what we're going to do is seek what all, all what federal funds are available to us and match them with what's existing in the state budget and reimagine how we can deploy these services. And should we at all be concerned about nonprofits and the private sector taking on what has traditionally been the role of government? I think nonprofits have already been at this for a long time, right? And one of the things that were clear, I mean, I worked in nonprofits for 20 years prior to joining the administration two years ago. And I'm even more clear now that government cannot do the work alone, right? I can't reach in on the west side of Chicago like I did for 20 years. And no, and that isn't the role of government, right? The role of government is, is to work with trusted messengers like the pastor, like Patricia, like Kate, who are on the ground and who provide comprehensive, holistic wraparound services who are steeped in community. We can't have a human services office on every corner, yet we should have human services available on every corner. And community-based organizations are the way to do that. 
Pastor Antonio, um, the deputy governor mentioned shame uh, it, among the reasons why people are not fully taking adv advantage of these federal programs. There's a stigma attached to receiving these benefits, isn't there? And that's something you've seen quite a bit in your work. Oh, definitely. I mean, uh, most people don't want to be in a line getting food. I mean, you know, that's, that's just something they have to do. So just being there uh, for a lot of people is very shameful. Um, but uh, I think the, the other part is um, that um, is, is the, um, the, the lack of uh, opportunities for them to be able to, uh, to, to uh, get ahead, to, to get a job, you know, uh, to, to get that shame out of them. I think, uh, I think that, that that's also something needs to be addressed. But definitely for a lot of men uh, that have to go to a food pantry to get food, that is very shameful. And we saw an increase, uh, you know, after COVID. Uh, most of our clients were women, women that were going uh, during the day because most of the men were working. Uh, we saw now an increase in men like, like I never seen. And most of them came, came, came in there with their heads down. You know, I, I don't want to be here. I don't know how to do this, you know, but, but I need it. So, yeah, they, this, there's a tremendous amount of shame that goes with just being in a line like that. I want to take a second uh, in a moment here to show some of Patricia's story, uh, which we produced for our firsthand series. Um, one thing you'll see in this clip is that she's part of a uh, basic income pilot program, which raises a question, Deputy Governor Flores, we've heard about these federal benefits like SNAP and WIC, and it's there's a lot of red tape, and we restrict how families can use the aid. It's, it's only designated for food. Why not just hand out cash to families and, and let them decide how to spend it? Well, I think um, there's a lot of conversation happening right now. I think there's proposed legislation uh, on the table. And, you know, obviously as an administration, we're going to look at everything. And, and we have had some examples and some success of that. During uh, last year's CARES uh, money distribution from the federal government, you know, as an example, uh, we, we um, invested money in the Illinois Welcoming Centers. And they were able to um, get money to households it was direct cash assistance and they could use that money for rent, for utilities, for groceries, because households knew what they needed best in that moment. And we saw tremendous success um, in doing that. And, and there are many examples and pilots, you know, we know across the country. Let's have a look uh, now at Patricia's story. And this clip starts with Patricia's mom showing how uh, repairs to their home are presenting a real financial challenge for her and her family. When the tree fell, I'm going to show you, the tree was here. And when the tree fell, it fell all way. I had a big tree. And it hundreds. fell this way. When the tree fell, it broke all, that it broke all of this. Mm -hmm. It broke into pieces. And then it knocked this whole garage out. That, that meant that now I have to decide whether I'm going to pay the whole light bill of right. partial. Right. Or get on a partial plan. plan. Now I got to get on a plan because I don't have the money for emergency. See, we I, I really never had emergency money. money. My daughter and I had had got some money from FII and we put it together and had him start on Sorry. the plan. Yeah. FII stands for Family Independence Initiative. So, I mean, like they give you a certain amount of funds to use towards your goals. I got to tell you about this here. One of the things that my mom wants to get done is her kitchen. What is okay, what about the, the windows? Didn't you say the we, about yeah, the windows, windows I'm getting them. She needed a new floor, new cabinet, sink, everything. The funds that FI give out, you do not have to pay it back. It's like a gift. And then we're going to get the new stove. FI money help with rent. FII money helped bring me back up today with my car notes, with the key of schooling. And it's water's leaking and we have- You're going to go through trials and tribulations while you live in this world. And you need help sometimes. And they was that organization that was like, we understand real life situations. They wanted to help people in our community that had goals, that it was hard or impossible to get along, you know, because of your credit or because of the color of your skin, or because of your income, you know? 
FII was like, we're not looking at any of that. We looking at a person that has a dream and a goal, and we just want to help you fulfill it. What kind of stuff have you done with your FII fund? Oh my God, I have done so much. Um, we just, re well, my three goals when we first started was to fix my credit, mm -hmm. to work towards um, buying a house, and to work towards my husband's truck. He has his own business. He didn't have a work truck. He had to rent trucks, and he had to pay like $45 to $50 a day. Yeah. So it was just like wasted money. I was really struck when you told me when your husband's truck broke down, yeah. his options were only to rent at really high cost. It just made me think about like the high cost of being broke. Mm -hmm. Everything costs more. <laughs> yes. Everything costs more. Wow. When we got our money, we set it in that account, and we did not touch it until we got the rest of what we needed to get his truck. Did you believe that the funds were really going to come? No. I believed that it was gonna have to, we was going to have to do something for it. I didn't think that it was going to be as easy as, as you said it was without having to pay anything back. That's, like, unheard of. Every day I still get asked, like, do you have your families go through, like, financial literacy or budgeting? Um, and the answer is no. Like, well, how do you work with them to set goals? I'm like, we don't. They don't need our help to set goals. Um, like, you and your husband know what you needed. FII was like, you know better than anybody what you need. You need help. Here's the help. Do whatever it is you need to do. It's just really important to us as an organization that we don't assume that people who might be struggling financially don't know what's best for them. Families are inherently strong and capable and smart. And you can trust them with resources. And right. that history has shown us that when you invest in people's initiatives, great things happen. We've been told no so many times. And we've been told we're not good enough as far as credit or income. So it's like, after you hear that so many times, it's like you give up on your goals. You give up on your dreams. Because you like, all I want to do is get a little wiggle room to really do what I want to do. FII was like a cushion. You know, it was something you could fall back on. Good morning. So even like working and having an income with me and my husband, you know, sometimes it's just like it's not enough. And due to the COVID-19, for five months, he was off work. That, like, really put a damper in things because he was off. But I didn't have to worry about a babysitter. I knew they was going to be with their dad because I was still working because my job was essential. So I went to work every day. I work for the Wick Food Center in Gage Park. WIC stands for Women, Infant, and Children. How you doing today? It's a government-funded program, and it's absolutely free. Hey, you want your receipt? It's a lot of moms that don't have the resources or the funds to go into grocery stores to get healthy produce or food or milk or formula. So it's just another resource that they have. <laughs> what I love about my job is every time a client come in, we try to make them feel like they're at home. Coupons and ID, please. Okay. We have the same name. We do? Ooh. Name twins, name twins. You should feel like you're okay. getting treated with A1 yeah. respect and like you're getting greeted and you're getting everything that you deserve as a person. Next time? Okay. It's not like a handout. It's help. Now I'm gonna remember you, Patricia. <laughs> I can't forget. I was on WIC with both of my kids, and it made a huge difference. I didn't have to worry about where I was getting milk, cheese, beans, eggs, juice. I definitely took advantage of it, and I'm so grateful. That was one of the reasons I wanted to get into working for WIC, because it really helped me. You all set? And I would wanted to help other moms as well. You all set? Have a good day. Thank you. Patricia, you said you try to make your customers feel like they're at home and they should be treated with respect and everything they deserve as a person. We heard a little bit about the shame that sometimes attached to accepting assistance. It sounds like you're trying to remove that stigma and that sense of shame. Yes, absolutely. Um, can you hear me, Dan? 
Yes, absolutely. Oh, okay. Okay. I'm making, I'm having some technical difficulties over here. Okay. So, um, yes, it's just more so like just making people feel, you know, like they're at home, like it's okay to get help every now and then. Like you're not alone. It's more so like making people feel like it's still hope out here. And we're all one big family. And if one somebody help another somebody, then we continue to keep helping each other and letting everybody know that it's okay. And that will make people feel comfortable, more comfortable with getting help from somebody because you're not look you're not looked down upon. Like, you know, um, you don't have enough or you don't make enough or um, you didn't go to school, you didn't get this degree or you can't do this, you can't do that. And it's just making people feel like, you know, we all want, we all human. And we all deserve the best out of life. So it's just making people feel at home and welcomed and it's okay to need help every now and then. Pastor Antonio, another thing we saw about Patricia's family is they're grappling with these other home expenses as is every working family. You, you say that customers at your food pantry uh, might be employed, but they have so many other household expenses that they might have to decide, for instance, between uh, taking a bus ride to work and eating or uh, prescription drugs and eating? Yeah, we saw, I mean, there, there's families that have, you know, five, six, seven kids. Uh, and sometimes their income, even though they're both working a lot of times, uh, like uh, Patricia was saying, it's just not enough. So a lot of times they have to make these hard decisions. You know, do, do we pay the gas bill? Do we buy uh, the kids the shoes they need? Um, do, do I take the bus or do I even walk uh, to try to save enough for the family? So we see these hard choices being made between, you know, even buying medicine or buying food, you know, which I think um, nobody should be doing those. Nobody, especially in, in, in a country like this, I don't think anybody should be having to make those kind of choices. Yeah, I think that's right, Dan. And just one thing I want to add to that after working with families for 20 years, you know, it's not just it's, of course, the basics like buying food, paying rent and utilities, but it's also like, hey, I'd like to take my kids out on a picnic or I want to enroll them in an art class or I'd like to buy them books. I think these are things that, you know, um, we take for granted in a middle class, uh, but working class families, you know, they don't get to make those choices every day. Uh, and so that's that's the other piece I just want to talk about and, and highlight. It's all the supplemental things that many families get to do, and yet some of Patricia's and the pastor's family don't have those options. And Kate Mayer, some of these families don't qualify for SNAP or WIC because they technically live above the poverty line, but still are struggling to put food on the table. Talk about that. That's right. So, you know, the, the way that these programs um, are organized by the federal government, there is an income threshold that determines whether you're eligible. Unfortunately, in cities where there's a high cost of living and other regions where there's a high cost of living, there are literally tens of thousands of people who make too much money to qualify for these programs. And yet, when you really look at the amount of money coming into the household and then what they have to pay for rent, for transportation. When they get to the end of the month, there's not any food in the household and there's no money in the bank account. And this is a reality for millions of people in the country. I would also lift up that there are many people who live across the country who aren't eligible for federal nutrition programs because of their immigration status. Um, and even, even more complicated, there are mixed immigration status households. So it may be that the parents don't qualify, but the children who have been born in the United States do. Unfortunately, one of the really troubling pieces of the last couple of years with the rhetoric around immigration is it's had a chilling effect. There are people who are afraid to avail themselves of these programs for fear that it will um, have consequences for their family. Deputy Governor Flores, there's a whole other issue we haven't touched on yet, which is that there are people who do claim the SNAP and WIC benefits and get on average currently $2.41 per meal. And that's actually just temporarily been raised from uh, as a result of the pandemic from $1.35 and presumably will go back down into the under $2 range. That's obviously not enough for a family. 
Yeah, that's right. I mean, it, historically, I think how SNAP has been designed is to be supplemental in nature, um, not the only source of uh, food support. And yet we know it's not enough. Uh, the temporary increase that you talked about, uh, I believe is in effect through the third quarter of this year uh, because of the American Rescue Act. Uh, but we look forward to other ways to extend it and or other ways to enhance and provide additional food staples uh, to people who need it most. So Kate, Jane. Mayor, let, let's talk about how they arrive at this very low dollar amount. It's set by the USDA uh, in what's called the Thrifty Food Plan, uh, which is supposed to offer enough money for a nutritious diet. But how do they come up with $1.35 per meal? Um, so this is a really wonky uh, piece. And I, and, and, I, and I will answer that. I also, I do want to go back to something that the deputy governor said, but just, just so quickly. So the way the, 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 um, the dollar threshold is set is it, it's, it's an antiquated system that goes back to the 1930s where it looks at um, sort of the cost of goods. Of course, the cost of food and the cost of housing has all changed significantly since this was put into place. And um, generally, like every economist across the board will tell you that this system is not the right system. So I'm really pleased that the federal government um, in January made an announcement that they're going to be revisiting this equation and they're going to look at what is the right um, way to determine the amount for this of benefits. And I anticipate that we would see coming out of that a more robust benefit. Um, and so that's uh, a little bit wonk wonky, but uh, super exciting. That's okay. This is public television. We can be wonky. In fact, I'm gonna, I want to make it even more wonky. The dollar amount is set based on raw ingredients, basically under the assumption that rather, for instance, than um, making be buying canned beans, you're buying dried beans and soaking them and cooking them, which no one I know actually has time to do. Is that right? right. That, that, that is that is absolutely right. Can I? So I wanted to um, something that the deputy governor said, and and I and I, I heard this um, sort of strand a couple of times. But you know, this question of you need both. You need strong federal nutrition programs that work really well and efficiently and um, are accessible, like SNAP, like WIC, like the school-based breakfast and lunch programs. But you also need a private response. There are people who do not qualify or for whatever reason aren't able to get that. So you need both. And I, I think that's one of the important things in the report that we talk about. There is, as you said, a recommendation around technology, but there's also this rec recommendation around collaboration. We recognize that it takes a village, right? It takes strong nutrition programs, but as the deputy governor said, you can't have an Illinois Department of Human Services office on every corner, but there are partners and providers and responses happening in every community across the state. And so the challenge is how do we bring everyone to the table to have a conversation about how we collaborate, how we work together towards a shared goal of making sure that no one in this great state ever has to go hungry. And of course, one of the roles of the private sector is to provide access to healthy food in communities and, and what are often known as food deserts. Patricia, you said that during the pandemic, many of your former customers at your WIC grocery store have instead been using their EBT link cards to go to corner stores where you said the options are typically less, less healthy. So talk about that. You're muted, Patricia. I'm sorry. So, um, yeah, so like I said, with everything that's going on, it's just, it's, it's quicker to go into a convenience store and grab um, some hot dogs or some noodles, something quick that the kids can throw in and eat or a microwavable dinner, something that's a dollar or two dollars, something that's quick because, you know, you have moms trying to work, you know, one or two jobs or dads working and everybody's trying to get back on their feet now because of everything that's been going on. So 
is like you know they do it for convenience. So they go in the corner store. Oh, I think we're losing you. Something um, real quick to feed, you know. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we, we got the gist of it, which is that, you know, families are working and they're busy and they don't have the time to prepare a meal, uh, which, as we said, these federal guidelines are based on the assumption that people are going to spend hours cooking every day. Um, and, and it also brings us to the point of access to healthy food. Uh, Pastor Antonio, you said that in Belmont, Craig, in the neighborhood where you're located, it's really hard to find fresh foods often. Yeah, a lot of families um, have a hard time because of the distance. So a lot of times having, having to pay for a bus to get food, you know, it's a double whammy for them. They don't have enough food. Now they got to now I got to spend money they don't have just to get to get to buy food. So a, a lot of people really struggle with that. Deputy Governor, um, so as Kate alluded to, this will require help from the private sector. How do you get healthy food retailers to open stores in neighborhoods that they have not previously seen as being profitable? Yeah, I think it requires, uh, you know, a lot of investment from local elected officials and using all the tools, financial incentive tools available to us. Um, there are some federal tools, state as well as municipal and local, uh, but it, you know it requires real leadership on on the part of those officials um, to sit down with corporate leaders, you know, and demonstrate that in our communities, you know, in Chicago South and West Side, you know, there is a, a richness uh of peoples and needs and funds, uh, there is money available to be spent. And so, uh, you know, with the right type of uh, guidance and I think um, push from the community and with the community, uh, we could really be continue to be innovative. So TIF funds, for instance, I know the Whole Foods in Englewood uh, was lured there in part uh, by $10 million in TIF funds. Is Are those the, the kind of tools you're thinking of? Yeah. Right. I mean, in my previous role, you know, we were able to access TIF funds as well as some HUD home funds, and we built a food pantry in conjunction with a clinic uh, in West Humble Park, and, and that's a you know an area of a food desert. And you know, for the past you know two years, La Casa Norte has been able to you know provide critical food staples um, to people in that local community. Kate yeah. Mayor, there's been another uh, major development in increasing access to food, and it's it's gone largely unnoticed. Uh, SNAP can now be used for delivery of food. Uh, and this January, more than 3% of SNAP dollars in Illinois were spent online. Why is that a breakthrough? So it is a huge breakthrough. And I, I think this is something, again, it's a little bit wonky, but it should be lifted up and celebrated because this really marked Illinois being at the front um, the leading edge of, of being innovative and in thinking about how we um, begin to create access for these programs. And so Illinois applied to be a part of a national pilot that is being conducted by the United States Department of Agriculture. There was a lot of work that was done. Um, the team uh, at Illinois Department of Human Services was persistent and patient and ultimately Illinois was accepted into this pilot program, which makes it possible for people to use their SNAP benefits shopping online. Um, and that's, you know, really important because Dan, when, when we talk about food access and, and you sort of said yourself, how do we get grocery stores to come into communities? The answer is probably that we're gonna need a variety of solutions. We all want strong, businesses in communities, particularly communities where there's been disinvestment for a host of reasons, but there are other ways that people can access food. And so online, we know, particularly during the COVID pandemic has been a really powerful way to connect people, but there are also other non-traditional outlets. There are farmers markets, there are small community growing efforts. And so I would encourage us to think about how do we define access to healthy food a little bit more broadly than just having a big box, big box grocery store opening in a neighborhood. And Pastor Antonio, uh, grocery delivery uh, seems very bourgeois. 
we're not necessarily talking about people uh, kicking up their heels and waiting for the groceries to show up. You have in your neighborhood a lot of uh, homebound uh, people with disabilities, elderly folks, and as you mentioned, people who don't want to spend ten dollars uh, in transportation to get to and from a grocery store. Yes, uh, we saw a need even before uh, COVID happened, uh, but um, when COVID came, okay, when COVID hit, I think the uh, the need for people that were in, that they were positive and couldn't go out and stuff that created another need that we had. So. Um, Pre-COVID, we were doing about uh, 20 deliveries a week. Uh, right now, we're about 100, 110 deliveries every every week that we're doing to these families that, that can come and, and would not get food otherwise. And when we last spoke, you were just about to buy a brand new uh, delivery vehicle, courtesy of the Greater Chicago Food Depository. Did you get the van? We already uh, baptized it. <laughs> uh, it, it was used uh, this, this week already. And believe me, it, it saved us a lot of trips, a lot of gas, uh, a lot of people trying to put stuff in small vehicles to try to take to people. Uh, I think uh, two trips it took uh, to do all these hundred deliveries. So as far as time and, 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 and saving gas and stuff, it, it, was, it was great. It was a big blessing. Deputy Governor, we talked about the uh, using SNAP for grocery delivery. So currently uh, that can be done through Amazon, Walmart, Instacart, and Aldi. Should we be concerned that these federal dollars aren't going into the pockets of local businesses? Well, I think we want to work to increase the number of businesses that that do that are participating in the program. Uh, for example, I was told um, that we are enrolling uh, Supermercados El Hierro, uh, which is an ethnic uh, grocer line that will also come online. And I think we're working to, to bring on more folks every day. And another uh, development that we've seen in food pantries lately, uh, Pastor Antonio, maybe you can talk about this, uh, is is being focused on culturally sensitive foods. The population you serve is predominantly Latino. You shared a very funny anecdote about receiving a large shipment of collard greens. Uh, yes, uh, collard greens is not very ethnic to us. <laughs> a lot of people don't even know what that is or how even cook it. So uh, people don't take it, you know, uh, because of that reason. So uh, trying to, to find foods that people will use and they're not gonna go to waste and that people recognize, I think it's, it's very important so that uh, people can actually use the product that we're getting. And Kate, I wanna bring you in here as well. Um, you both, you, both you and Pastor Antonio talked about, uh, Pastor Antonio calls it a full client choice pantry, that it's not just like here, here's a bag of food we prepared for you, but more and more uh, food pantries are like grocery stores where you get to pick and choose what you want to eat. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, um, it is a best, best practice and a high standard. Unfortunately, that's been one of the things in COVID that's been really challenging is that um, keeping people safe has also meant we've had to pre-box a lot of food and, and limit the amount of contact. Um, and in watching Patricia in that video, we know how important that human contact is and also the, the opportunity each of us wants to be able to pick our own food with with that choice comes dignity. We need to remember that the people who need food, it could be us. These are our neighbors, they are humans. And I think it's so important for us to remember the common humanity. Um, human beings, this is not a luxury. As, as you said, Dan, it's not a bourgeois fact. It is actually, I think, a human right to be able to have food and to have it with dignity. For all of you watching at home, by the way, please enter your questions in the chat. I would love to pose your questions to our panel. Uh, Kate, Mayor, maybe you can talk a little bit uh, following up on what Pastor Antonio said about culturally appropriate food. You've also uh, changed your approach to procuring food. Is that right? You used to for very, um, for, for reasons that can be justified, looked for the, the least expensive food options possible so you could serve as many people as possible, but that approach has changed. That's right. We've really, um, in part because of great feedback from, from people, 
people like the pastor have really challenged ourselves to think about how do we source food differently. Um, for one thing, we want to source more of our food locally. Um, I'd rather spend my dollars in the great state that I live in than spend my dollars bringing food in from California. Um, I also um, think that there is an opportunity to source and match more culturally relevant foods. So um, I think Pastor Antonio, in addition to getting colored greens, I think we might have gotten that straightened out. He's getting avocados, which is something that he wants and his community is really clamoring for. And so that's a really important piece. I would also say that there is a really important investment, um, and Patricia can talk about this because WIC does this beautifully, around nutrition education and just in general sort of helping people understand how to cook food and to become more familiar. Not everybody looks at a zucchini and knows what to do with it. And so there's more that we can do around that. <clears throat> yeah, Patricia, your Absolutely. grocery store has pre-COVID was doing um, cooking classes and nutrition education. Is that right? Yeah. So um, we do nutrition education um, year round. We um, In the summertime, we have a cooking class and um, any mom, and they can bring their kids along as well. And we do it for a week. We go in our nutrition room and we um, show them how to cook different foods with our WIC items. And it's just something simple, you know, something, um, some fruit and um, vegetables with the greens. We make up something that also during the um, summertime, every day you can go in any WIC store and it's somebody there that's passing out different um, menus that you can uh, put to use with your wig food items that you don't have to cook. It's just as simple as opening up a can of fruit cocktails and adding um, some juice with it. And you just eating it, you know, adding some uh, watermelon, something that the kids can have that's fun, that's nutrition for them and that's good for them. So we do a lot of different, uh, right now, she was talking about the farmer's market. Right now we have farmer's market going on in the WIC food centers, we're giving away boxes of food every day um, on 53, 5332 Southwestern, where I work. We're giving away free food today and tomorrow. You can come from 9 to 6 p.m. and you don't have to be on WIC. You just come in and you get a free box of food. So, and it's all nutrition foods in there, apple, oranges, yogurt, something, you know, healthy for anybody. So um, we do it all. We try to help the community with um, just eating healthy and learning more about, you know, your, your nutrition facts and what you should be putting inside your body and what's healthy for you. And um, everything is fresh. Um, we get fresh produce in every other day. We check our produce every day and we make sure that everything is fresh, you know, that everything is clean and that everything is good. So yeah, we do, we do it all. We have a question from the audience. Nancy Quinn wants to know if there are any particular initiatives right now that the public um, could support, I guess, either with their dollars or with their time. I'll just, I'll lift up that there are, um, there's a network of amazing food banks that serve the state of Illinois, um, seven food banks that are all a part of the Feeding America network of food banks. So Northern Illinois Food Bank, which serves uh, the Collar Counties, River Bend Food Bank, which serves the Quad Cities, Central Illinois Food Bank, Eastern Illinois Food Bank, the St. Louis Area Food Bank, the Tri-State Food Bank, and then the Greater Chicago Food Depository. So all of these organizations are on the front lines. Um, you also saw there are lots of great food pantries and they all need volunteers and food and support. Uh, mm -hmm. And if you go to feedingamerica.org, you can actually get linked to a food bank or food pantries right in your community. Pastor Antonio, uh, so people are getting vaccinated now. The economy uh, seems to be poised to rebound. Do you imagine the lines disappearing at your pantry anytime soon? Not at all. Uh, I think Patricia mentioned that, you know, um, a lot of people live pay, pay, paycheck to paycheck. Uh, and, and they feel behind during COVID. And it's going to take a while for them to get back on their feet and, uh, you know, start doing even some of the stuff that Deputy Governor was saying, even just go out, you know, anywhere to enjoy your family time. So I think this is this is going to be um, going on for at least this year and possibly into next year as well. Yeah. Kate Mayor and Sol Flores, you're the co-chairs of the Illinois Commission to End Hunger. Is that just a name or are you optimistic that you can achieve that goal? 
I'll, I'll, I'll start. Um, I actually, I really do believe that we can solve this. We, we live in the greatest state and the greatest country in the history of the world. We have enough food. We have more than enough food, not just to feed the people in the state, but to feed this world. This is a solvable problem. But it does require that we have conversations and we have will and that we are willing to work together to be innovative, to bring forward a future where everyone has access to what they need to live a healthy, vibrant life. Deputy Governor. I'd say well said, Kate. Uh, we have to do this. Right. This is our, this is the center of our moral compass. This must be done. Right. Um, I would just add to that. You know, part of the work that like you hear the pastor and Patricia and Kate and I saying too is, you know, this is about eliminating the stigma associated with poverty. So the same work that we're doing in the behavioral health care space, in the substance use space. You know, if you have cancer or diabetes, you go to the doctor, you raise your hand, and you have a community support you. It has to be the same way if you're hungry. Right. It has to be the same way if you are um, an alcoholic or addicted to opioids or suffering from mental illness. And we've really got to shift the conversation in this country, in this state, that it is not a crime to be poor and it is not someone's you know, identity. It's a set of circumstances that we can help move people through and that people want to, to move through. I love what Patricia said in the video. Your story is not about when you were down. It's about when you're up. Uh, and that's what we have to stay focused on, uh, continue to you know, lift people up and as they stand up, um, help them to keep walking and running. Thank you for leaving us with that hopeful note and thanks everyone for joining us. And thank you always to our members, funders and partners for their support of this project. A reminder, you can watch the entire firsthand Living in Poverty documentary series on the PBS app and at wttw.com slash firsthand. There you can also find expert talks, text journalism, a discussion guide, and more. Thank you all at home for joining us this evening and have a good night.